I have open my code from one variant of the library card assignment that has a little bit of HTML5. Like at the top, I set the doc type and HTML tag uh, the same way we would with uh, HTML5. But I'm actually using a table in here, which is kind of more HTML4, but I thought I would show it to you anyway. Before I get started, the first thing I need to mention is that forms need a program to run them. And this is not a programming class, so I'm not expecting people to learn how to program, but I do have a form that's actually mentioned in the text that will, I mean a script, not a form, I have a script here that will take whatever you put in your form, regardless of what you label it or anything like that, and simply regurgitate it for you, just show it to you. So inside the form tag, which is the new tag for this chapter, chapter 16 by the way, there is uh, an action in there, action attribute, and the value inside that action attribute is this URL, jimmynolan.com slash webdesign slash showform.php. And I just added this URL to the assignment page. I'd forgotten to mention that before. And I'll also mention here that the method I'm going to use for this particular form is post. There is a difference between using post and get, um, and to put it in a simple kind of short explanation post is going to take all the stuff in the form and box it up so that it's not publicly viewable while it's transferred over the web and git which is much more like what amazon would use or probably an opac for that matter git allows the information in a form to be publicly visible it depends on how you're making your forms most of the time people use post because it's uh, it offers at least a modicum of privacy in terms of the data. If a hacker really wanted to get access to stuff inside a, a form on its way to a script, using post isn't the really the only way to uh, protect yourself. But it's uh, basically the most common way to do it because most people don't want their uh, form data available in the URL. Uh, if you look at if you take a look at the way Amazon's pages are displayed, the uh, information about how your record was brought up, all the metadata and the search terms, all of that's in the URL. So that's more of a Git mentality, and we're going to use post here um, because I just think it's more common. Okay, first things first, uh, before we get into the actual, f any more into the form stuff, I've got a table tag here. So what does a table do? I'm going to show you the way I've got, you know, this is his example. Here's the result of the code I'm about to show you. And this thing right here is a table. Table has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rows, and a total of only two columns. So you'll notice that the first and the last actually span across. Um, and the reason I've set this form up using a table is so that my labels can show up right next to the form element. So name is right next to this text box, address is next to the text box, so is email and phone. Okay, uh, so before we go back to the table, and since I'm here already, I'll mention what these are. These four are text boxes. This one down here is called the text area. This is a pull down menu called select, and this is a radio button, which for those of you who've ever used uh, an old AM radio, or I guess an FM radio for that matter that's old enough, there were specific preset physical buttons you would press that would slide the dial over to that part of the radio, and that's where the names come from. Uh, a lot of folks who've never interacted with a radio like that don't really know why we call them radio buttons, and that's why. And the last two elements down here are buttons, a submit button and a reset button. These are all the things I'm asking you to put on your page. <clears throat> so when you're done, yours should look vaguely like this. Now, I haven't done anything with the... the uh, I made the font Arial, but other than that, I didn't do anything with CSS. It's really just a quick and dirty example of getting a, a form together. So let's look back at my code. So yeah, I have a table in there, um, and there are some details here that you, as you read through the stuff about tables in the text um, will make a little bit more sense, but you can see I've set the width to 80%. Each cell has a padding of 5 pixels. I've went ahead and aligned it in the center, which is very, very old school. Uh, HTML5 really doesn't like to do it this way, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and use this older method for now. And I've set the border to one. By default, tables have a border of zero, which means they don't show up when you look at them. I've set mine to one just so we can see it. And so on line 14, you'll see I've got a TR, 
which stands for table row, and then next to that is something called a TD, which stands for table data. Okay, you'll also notice that I set one of the attributes here is call span equals two. And if you go back and look at complete and print this form to get a library card, notice this cell, this one TD, actually spans across both rows, which is where that comes from. So when I go down and look at the next row where I have name, you'll notice there's not one TD, there's actually two. There's one there that uh, just has the word name, and there's one here that actually has a form element in it. Input name equals patron name, type equals text. So just by putting input and type equals text, it makes a text box right there. So here's my first TD right here, where name, and here's my second one with the, the text field. So let me say this again. TR stands for row, TD stands for cell or table data. So on my first row, I only have one cell because it's spanning across two different columns. But on the others, name, address, email, phone, 18 or over, what is the best way to contact you in comments, each of those there are two TDs. One for the label and then another for the actual form element. Notice that uh, the name, the address, the email, and the phone number, they're just plain text. You do get to set the uh, size, how big each of the text boxes will be displayed in the browser. You can make it bigger or smaller if you don't like 25 characters. Um, and it kind of, you have to sort of play with it to see which one you like the most. But those are all text boxes. And anything I type into the box, no matter what it is, gets displayed in my uh in the results. Um, and so there's no real limit on what you can put in any of these boxes. You can type as much as you'd like. Okay, radio buttons. Radio buttons are also input. So you notice that there's that tag again, input, but the type is not text, the type is radio. By the way, the name for each of these is very important if you're the one writing the script. So in my case, the script we are writing doesn't do anything except literally dump out everything the script gave it. So in this case, it doesn't matter what your names are, but in, in the case of a script that you might say purchase or might be given, there might be uh, pieces of the script that you have to exactly match. So patron name, patron address, patron email, patron phone, that would actually have to refer to something in my script for this to, uh, for the form and the script to work together. So um, that's kind of a beyond the scope of our class for what we're doing but I thought I'd mention why there are names in there. Notice that the name for the radio button makes a really big difference. The names must match in order for the browser to know that the yes button and the no button are part of a set. In order for that to work, I have to actually give them the same name. If I didn't give them the same name, the browser wouldn't realize that the two buttons are connected. Because with a radio button, I can hit one or I can hit the other. Or maybe you, you could even have seven or eight of them if you wanted, but you can only hit one at a time. And so by making sure all of them have the exact same name, the browser won't let the user pick more than one at a time. In this case, it was a yes or no question. So I put my value as yes for one and no for the other. You can, if you want, put other pieces of information inside the value, but this is what goes to the browser, I mean to the script, once the browser, once you type everything in and save it and hit submit, whatever's inside value for this radio button, that's what gets sent over to the script. In the case of the text boxes though, it's whatever the user actually typed in there. So in, in the case of a text box, what's sent to the script is whatever the user typed. In the case of the uh, radio button and the menu, it's whatever you put inside value. <clears throat> okay, so You'll notice that I put the two radio buttons, even though they take up two lines in my text editor, it's really only one cell worth of data. Here's the opening TD and there's the closing TD right there. I did that so that the label yes is right next to the radio button and the label no is right next to its radio button. That way it's a little bit easier for the user to know exactly what's going on. If I put them on separate lines or if I had the word yes and the radio button on its own line, it may be hard to figure out which is which. Um, this seems to be pretty straightforward. You can always change it around where the word is after the radio button. As long as you're consistent and the person looking at the form knows how to fill it out, it's all good. So let's talk about the pull down menu. This is not an input type like the others. Instead of input type equals text or input type equals radio, this is called a menu. And the tag is select and then slash select. So unlike the input tags, which have an opening but not a closing version, the radio, I mean the uh, pull down menu, you do have to not only open up select but actually close it. I'm still inside one TD. So look, here's the opening TD, here's the closing TD. So I'm still inside one cell here. Uh, but what I've done is I've made one, two, three separate options in the pull down menu. Notice all three values 
pretty closely match what the user is going to see in the menu. So even though they see the word email or phone or mail, the value that's sent to the script is actually the same thing. That way it kind of makes sense. Um, the, the form and the script and the user's input all kind of make sense. So if I go look at this pull down menu, I can choose any of these. Now I'm allowed to select the first one also, choose, but notice there's no value for that one. That is, you can if you want leave this thing out and have the uh, first item on the list be the default selected. Um, or if you want to force the user to select something, you can put a blank menu option in like I did here that doesn't actually have a value. That way they'll have to pull it down, see which one they want, and select it. Okay, so the only two things left here are the text area and the radio buttons. I mean the, the submit and reset buttons. The text area here, let's put this on its own line, or let's make a little room. There we go. The text area, which is here, represents this big box here. So there's the comments label, just like I've labeled all the other ones, I labeled this guy. But the text area, the browser does all this by default, by the way. It, makes, it determines how big to make it. You can set the uh, number of rows and the number of columns. You get to pick the name, just like with, the, with all the other form elements. But you don't want to put anything in between text area and slash text area. You don't want to do that, because that would actually put content in here... As soon as the user opened up the form, there'd be stuff already in the box. So um, typically, it's kind of bad design to put text in there that the user then has to select and delete. Um, but you can if you want. That's the point of having an open tag text area, closing tag text area. Just by leaving it blank, though, it makes a big box like this. Okay, and now for the buttons. The browser already knows what the submit and the reset buttons do. That's why there's one input called type submit and another input called type reset. It already knows what they do. And just by calling it submit and reset, I get the button submit and reset. So that's how those work. Submit, by the way, without a submit button, the browser has no way to take all the data the user put into the form, box it up, and send it off to the script that I mentioned up here in action. So without a, a submit button, you can have the user fill all this out, but there's no way to actually run this program to get this action to do its thing. And the reset button does what you would expect. I fill out the form, and when I hit reset, it deletes it all. Notice there was no warning. Are you sure you want to do this? So let's see how this works. Jimmy Newland, address 1600 or 1660 Road Street. Email is Jimmy, join that, that, join at email.com, which isn't real. Phone is 713-667-2064. The number of a local high school, yes, I'm over 18. Um, I would like to be contacted via, via, how about via email, comments, I like libraries. Now this form doesn't actually do anything, so when I hit submit, all it really does is dump it all out. So this is what show form does for you. It takes each of your fields and actually prints them out in a table form. It doesn't send an email, it doesn't save it in a database or anything like that, which are the most likely things you would do with this. The only real goal here is to get a form that simply exists. It doesn't really have to do much, okay? So you'll notice that at the very bottom here, I went ahead and mixed together the form and the, the table, so I want to make sure to explain how that works. I open the form first, so I have to close the form last. I open the table inside the form, so I have to close table before I can close form, okay? So one more time, at the very bottom here where I've got my submit and reset buttons, you'll notice there's a call span equals two right there. That's because, let's go back and look at it, that's because I ended up having this one TD, this one cell, span across both rows. So I spanned across with the top one and I spanned across with the bottom one. Um, your form, you are required in your group presentations at some point to have a form on there. It doesn't have to be real. You can use the show form action just like I did, or none at all for that matter. Um, but you are required to have a form and you are required to have a table. I figured by me explaining tables and forms together, you could take care of two birds with one stone. Uh, you could make a form that used a table and take care of both of those elements. There might be some other place in your um, group website that you might want to use a table. The goal is to keep it simple. The more complicated you make your table, the easier it is to get lost in the code. Just because I put each of these TRs on their own line doesn't mean I had to. I could have, if I'd wanted, written them all together on one big line and it would still display one line at a time.